I've listened to In the Airplane Over the Sea by Neutral Milk Hotel for years. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Spin It, the Record Ranking Podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James. With me and fully healed is Connor. The hospital bill is insane. I mean, I was in there for a whole year. A year-long <laughs> healing stint? Yeah. I, I'm in crippling medical bill debt, but it was all worth it because we're healed! That's right. Welcome to year four of the podcast, a year that we have excitedly dubbed the year of discovery. New music is out there. Tons of it. And we're going to find it all. That's right. My vision for the year of discovery, now that we're healed, is to kind of branch out and give you some stuff that's maybe a little less mainstream, maybe a little like stuff you haven't heard of, things that are maybe a little more niche or mm. not as you said a couple episodes ago right up connor alley let's see and maybe you know we'll bring some albums that i discovered in interesting ways and it won't not every week is going to be like that you know we'll still hit a lot of the highlights and stuff but so for me i'm not really going to notice a difference because i'm not really an album guy so almost every week's a discovery for me <laughs> that's true <laughs> this is a podcast of discovery for you yeah yeah well, here's another one. Here's another one to discover. Starting off year four, I think pretty strong. Good year. Yeah. And we're starting with what I think is maybe the most cult classic album that I've given you so far. It's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the title of the album, the title of the band, the title of the tracks. A lot going on here. It's a lot. Yes, it is. A lot to digest. And I'm excited about it. This is one of those albums that's probably beloved by the most uh, annoying music people you know, <laughs> if I had to guess. Well, you're the most annoying music lover I know, so. Well, there you go. See? Is it beloved by you? This is an album I found through a college roommate. He liked this album and he liked this band. Oh, and he was the most annoying music person you know. Got it. No, <laughs> it's not exclusively liked by people who are the most annoying music people you know. I'm just uh, the most annoying music people you know definitely have a thing for this album okay so i'm guessing neutral milk hotel isn't a band that you've heard of no but i do think it's fitting that we're starting the year discovery off the way we started the podcast off with a band you'd never heard of no with milk oh with milk yeah like kings of leon and walls and their weird milky album cover yeah and also the first couple songs on this one king of the carrot flower. Oh, they were just like the king of Leon. Of Leon. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. You're right. Weirdly full circle kind of moment, I guess. And there's two two-headed boys, and there was four heads in the milk on Kings of Leon. <laughs> and there's the fool, and you're still here. How dare you? How could you do this to me? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to send me back to the hospital already. <laughs> <laughs> no more healing. We're done. We've got so much territory to explore. It's true. I'm all packed up and ready to adventure into the wild outdoors of music. Yeah, ready to get on the airplane and fly over the sea. Go to places no podcast has gone before. Oh, so many podcasts have gone to this place, actually. This oh. is well-trod ground. We'll go to places many podcasts have been before. Yeah, this is the cult classic of cult classics. Neutral Milk Hotel started out as the solo project of Louisiana-born Jeff Mangum. He was born in 1970, and growing up in Louisiana, he met his friends and future Elephant Six bandmates, Robert Schneider, Will Hart, and Bill Doss. They all obviously loved music, and they especially loved the prospect of recording music at home. Definitely a very different beast in the mid-80s than it is today with, like, digital. We've got recording software and DAWs and just, like, digital recording equipment. In the 1980s, you're going to have to get some tape and, like, a mixing deck and all kinds of special equipment. But they loved it, and that's what they all started to do. They started playing around with tape recorders and really turned themselves into a makeshift record label or, like, a loose musical collective that would grow and expand over time. And that's what Elephant Six was. It started out as a fictional, half-baked, homemade record label project. After he graduated high school, Jeff Mangum started college at Louisiana Tech, but he dropped out and moved to Athens, Georgia to pursue music. Remember, Athens, Georgia, that's the home of alt-rock. 
right? Like we talked about REM, alt granddads. So he starts getting all these alt influences into his music making style. He even spent some time kind of being a floater all over the country, just not tied down or living in one place. As he's traveling, he's working, making music. He put out his first demo tape in 1993 called Hype City Soundtrack, which kind of ended up being this critique of commercial music, especially in big cities. So right from the jump, he's kind of got this, I don't know, satirical edge, this bite to his music. But he loved it. He really enjoyed the project, and it inspired him to further delve into making music under the name Milk. Just Milk. Not in a hotel yet, not declaring neutrality yet, just Milk. But he realized there was already a band called Milk. Apparently, too good of a band name. Someone had already snatched it up. And he said, okay, well, then let's neutralize the milk and give it a place to stay. Neutral Milk Hotel. The rest is history. Is that a good band name to you? I think it's pretty bad. Really? But, like, it's one of those things that it's a bad starting band name. Like, to start out, like, naming yourself that. Mm. It's going to make you very hard to grow and become popular, I think. But I think as, like, a well-known band, that's an awesome, catchy, like, unique standout name. So it's, like, one of those things that, like, the more popular you get, the better your name becomes. Mm. But it's a rough one to start out with. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I honestly, I think it fits this album and the kind of music and aesthetic that he's embraced, I think it fits that really well. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird name for a weird album, I think. It just matches up. Fair enough. Eccentric, maybe. Weird feels a little judgmental. Eccentric feels like I'm trying to deliberately avoid being judgmental, even though it still kind of has the same connotation. <laughs> I don't know. You get the idea. It's different. Neutral Milk Hotel's first singles, Everything Is and Ruby Bulbs, came out to pretty solid critical success and actually got him signed with Merge Records. That's what paved the way for his debut proper LP on Avery Island. He recorded that album in Denver, Colorado in 1995 and released it the next year to more positive reviews. The Neutral Milk Hotel wave is starting to sweep the country a little bit. It sold 5,000 copies right off the bat, which like darn near exceeded all the label's expectations. People right away started to notice it was a little eccentric, a little off. The Houston Chronicle called on Avery Island trippy, and they said it was downright crowded with noise, and they gave it four out of five stars. NME gave it an eight out of 10, and they said Neutral Milk Hotel can convert miserable as sin introspection into folky mantras that bore into your skull like a well-aimed power drill. I don't know if you got any skull power drilling on this album. I sure do. I get it every Tuesday. <laughs> no wonder your hospital bills are so high. That sounds absurd. <laughs> that was part of the treatment. <laughs> uh-huh. So the album gets pretty big. Mango decides it's time to take this one-man band of Neutral Milk Hotel and beef it up a little bit. So he expands Neutral Milk Hotel to a four-piece, including bassist Julian Coster, drummer Jeremy Barnes, and Scott Spillane, a multi-instrumentalist and a composer. So together, the four of them moved to New York City, and they lived together in a little house owned by Julian Coster's grandma. They start actively trying to push their comfort zone and their musical boundaries. They worked on playing instruments that aren't their usual things. Instead of guitars and bass and drums and whatnot, they start picking up accordions and horns and other strange instruments that are not typically what they do. We'll talk about a few more of those once we get into this album. There's some really interesting stuff I found. In 1997, after the On Avery Island tour wrapped up, the band finally had the funds and they had the music ready to pour into their sophomore and what would go on to be their final album in the airplane over the sea. Did you know that this was their last album? Their second and final forever? When I listened to it, no. I see. The mixtaper told me that it was, though. <laughs> Okay, so you you figured it out. Yeah. It's definitely a way to go out with a bang. They recorded in the airplane over the sea from July to September in 1997, and they recorded it at Pet Sounds Studio in Denver, and I know how much you loved Pet Sounds. Did I? I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> Too long ago. <laughs> I don't think I did. Did I give it like a six or a five even? You, no, you, you kind of lambasted the Beach Boys, but also I don't think the studio was any relation to the Beach Boys. Did I give them a four? What did I give the Beach Boys? I thought you gave them a six. Yeah, low six. Low six six okay my poor heart but pet sounds studio it's not really like a studio studio it kind of is but also it's a house i think it's a house that they 
converted into a studio. Basically what they did was they paid their friend to rent out every single room in his house except for his personal bedroom. His house. Every room except the bedroom. His house. I guess for a while you could say it became the Neutral Milk Hotel. Hotel. The house was jumping. Neutral Milk Hotel weren't the only people working on projects in there at the time. It was a very like music commune kind of vibes, I think. One of the focuses that they had in recording in the airplane over the sea was a raw, rough, very intentionally lo-fi, low-quality kind of sound. Their music, especially on Airplane, is distorted and it's gritty and it's raw. It's like the kind of stuff they were so fascinated by early on with home recordings and tape recorders. They said, how can we do that now with real equipment and real music and bring that to the table in a way that's new and different. And what they decided to do was they ditched distortion pedals and sound effects, all kinds of things that like modern artists still use. And instead of that, producer Robert Schneider opted to use heavy, heavy, heavy compression on the tracks. And what that does is it brings the highs and the lows closer together. Like think about a waveform as you talk or record something and compression, it smushes it and makes it smaller from like top to bottom. Whoa. Yeah, so your sound gets a lot more compressed, I guess. Muddled. Compressed, yeah. Distorted, yeah. yeah. So almost every instrument that they recorded for this album got run through a preamp and then it got compressed and then it got sent through a mixing console and then they maxed it out on a cassette tape. And they did that for almost every instrument on almost every track. And it worked. This was an album unlike anything anyone had ever heard. Their biographer, Kim Cooper, asserted that In the Airplane Over the Sea actually might be one of the most heavily distorted albums of all time because of all that behind the scenes work they did on it. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I think that's true. I mean, I haven't encountered an album that's even scratched its surface yet, I think, in terms of sound quality and distortion. I don't know if there's much out there like this. As for its composition, Jeff Mangum was still the primary songwriter. He wrote all the lyrics himself, and it's a trip. <laughs> These songs, the lyrics, they're often really intense, disjointed images that kind of just batter you around and put you in a headlock, and it's just a mess. One critic, Chris DeVille, said that Aeroplane collides the familiar and the disorienting in a way that renders meaning elusive, even as it provokes an intense emotional reckoning. Other people have compared it to a twisted sort of fairy tale, a coming-of-age story, a psychedelic nostalgia trip, pitchforks... Mark Richardson said that Airplane was an album of memories and associations, how skin feels against the grass, and what passes through your mind the first time you realize your own powerlessness. It puts ultimate faith in raw feelings in a kind that consume you without logic or sense. And I can't wait to get, like, your take. <laughs> on some of the lyrics and the images and the random bits of this album that might have elicited responses. I've got takes. Good. I've got gives. I guess this was my give, and whatever you took from it, you took. Are they hot takes or cold takes? I guess you wouldn't know if you've never heard of Neutral Milk Hotel. <laughs> I say, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you if they're hot takes or cold takes, I guess. <laughs> or I guess just whether I agree or disagree. Because this is an album, I feel like it can be divisive. But I also feel like it shouldn't be. Jeff Mangum himself never definitively spoke much about any of the lyrics or about the album's inspiration. He's a very private guy. But a lot of thoughtful fans have surmised and kind of extrapolated that this album draws heavily, heavily, heavily from World War II, from the 1940s, and more specifically, it draws a lot from Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl. Mangum has come out and said that she was definitely a big part of his inspiration for this album. After reading her diary, he said he spent about three days crying, and he even, like, dreamed of going back in time to save her. I read somewhere, at one point, he even called her his perfect woman. It's a very complicated relationship that Jeff Mangum has with Anne Frank, and a lot of people think that that's kind of what led into a lot of the parts of this album. But nobody's really sure if it's, like, a whole concept album about her, or if she's just, like, a significant character, a major player in a record with a bigger scope and more story to tell. Did you pick up on a concept like that? Have you read The Diary of Anne Frank? Have I read it? I own it. The, again, doesn't necessarily... But no, I haven't read it. No. <laughs> really? I feel like I read that in, like, middle school. And I meant to actually reread it before doing this episode, because it's... We might have read it or read part of it. I don't know. Did we read it as part of a class? I read it as part of an English class. Yeah, but were, was it the, like, advanced English class in 8th grade? No. 
It was just normal English class in like sixth grade. Then, then I probably read it. I think I read it when I was way <laughs> too young to know much or like engage thoroughly enough with it. Did you get any of it from this album? I mean, world, maybe not Anne Frank if you never read the diary or don't remember reading the diary, but like World War II, you get 1940s vibes. Uh, definitely on track six. Right, the one that's titled Holland 1945. <laughs> it does kind of spell it out. Communist Daughter did it for me a little bit too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few moments in here. And I don't know, some of the imagery he uses is really intense in the context of World War II. The history nerd in me really appreciates that aspect of this album. I'm a history nerd. It's a concept album. It's a whole thing. I don't know. Basically, the whole album feels like this warm, fuzzy fever dream that you never really wake up from, I think. So he writes the album. They record the album. And Frank inspired World War II lyrics, compressed instruments more than anyone's ever heard. In the Airplane Over the Sea came out on February 10th, 1998. And the label's initial run was 5,500 CDs and about 1,600 vinyl records. That was their initial projection. And they were pretty spot on with that. The first part of its life cycle, back before it became a cult classic and was just like a contemporary release, sales were steady, but slow-ish. About the same as his first record on Avery Island, and, you know, strong, but not, wow, mind-blowing. The band did end up going on a wild North American and European tour, though. They were known for just cutting loose and going crazy at their live shows. People would get tossed through drum sets. Sound engineers never knew what to expect. You know, who was going to yell or what instrument was going to end up where. It was just the whole time. Ben Crum, a member of the Great Lakes that was on tour with Neutral Milk Hotel, said that watching them on stage was definitely dangerous. He said there often seemed to be a very real chance that someone would get hurt. So I really wish I could have seen their live show. But I was just a wee youth in 1998 and would not have probably been safe in that environment. You wouldn't have appreciated it. No, I definitely wouldn't have appreciated it. That's true. I would have probably cried through most of it. <laughs> well, it would have been loud and chaotic, and I would have been just like a baby. Anyway, critical response was decent. On its release, it got a 6 out of 10 from NME, an 8.7 from Pitchfork, which is remarkably high, I think, and a 3 out of 5 stars from Rolling Stone. Pitchfork said it was as catchy as it is frightening. So it was all right. As kind of like positive lukewarm as Critical Response was, Airplane still made a lot of year-end best lists, and it was a fan favorite. As a result, Neutral Milk Hotel once again starts to gain popularity a lot. That turned out to be horribly detrimental for Mangum's mental health. As the band and his personal reputation grew, he starts to withdraw from public life. He said that it was so acute, this fame and this like newfound stress that he had, he said a lot of the basic assumptions that he held about reality started crumbling. Other prevalent speculation is that as this album got popular and more people started to hear it and get curious about it, they started to ask him about these lyrics and all these songs that he'd written, and he got so tired of just having to rehash and re-explain everything and all his lyrics to journalists, to fans, like that might have been taking a toll. Other people have speculated that the bar that he set with Airplane was raised so high that any future release that he tried to put out would just not be able to live up to the hype that this album generated for it. Either way, whatever the reason, Jeff Mangum decides it's time to hang it up. He disappears so quietly and so completely that he didn't even tell the rest of the band that he was done. He just leaves. Neutral Milk Hotel is sitting around waiting on something else to do and nothing happens and nothing happens and eventually the band members start to move on one by one and that was it. This band came like a bolt from the blue, dropped one of the most captivating albums ever created, and then they vanished just as fast as they'd arrived. And I think it's possible that that's exactly why this album and Neutral Milk Hotel have such a cult following, right? There's this mystery and this intrigue that comes with knowing nothing about where they came from and knowing we're never going to get any more. Like, this is all we have. Yeah, no, I get it. And it's pretty final, too. One music journalist and Neutral Milk Hotel fan, like, tried to reach out to Jeff Mangum and track him down after the fact, and he got a very cold response. He basically just said, go away. <laughs> He said, I'm not an idea. I'm a person who obviously wants to be left alone. Leave me alone. Yeah. 
Like, I'm not engaging with you anymore. Another journalist, Mark Richardson, also speculated that that was a large part of the intrigue. He said because Mangum was inaccessible, there was no outlet for connection other than the record itself and other fans who shared a passion. So that's it. It's people telling people about this album, spreading the word of mouth. People, just like my roommate did to me, they shared this album and word gets out. Everyone joins the Neutral Milk Hotel cult following. Mangum actually has done very occasional solo work since and Neutral Milk Hotel even did do a little reunion tour from 2013 to 2015 before taking another extended hiatus. Mm. Their last post on their website said, Dear friends, we love you, but it's time to say goodbye for the never-ending now. So that's kind of the mysterious story of Jeff Mangum, Neutral Milk Hotel, and In the Airplane Over the Sea. Now we get to talk about it and dive into it in a more opinionated personal sense. I'm so excited to hear what you have to say. Oh, the year of discovery is going to be so fun. <laughs> but first, we have to play a little fact or spin. It's a new season. It's a new year. Oh, you're ready for fact or spin. There's a fact I'm surprised you didn't bring up. Oh, is it a fact that you know or a fact that you're going to let the mixtaper tell me? There's just one thing that the mixtaper didn't even bother with because he just assumed. I might know it. I might not. Did you not? Did I miss it? Did you mention that Neutral Milk Hotel was just nominated for a Grammy? Oh, I didn't mention that. No, but <laughs> we did talk about that in our Grammy predictions episode, and I'm sure I called them out then for that. Yeah, it just it blew my mind that you didn't. It was, the, it was their collection. Yeah, yeah. For their... I remember talking about it because I said... It's like a Neutral Milk Hotel box set. They put out two albums. Yeah. It's so small. Best box, their special limited edition package. The collected works of Neutral Milk Hotel. I mean, we've got half the collection right here in Aeroplane. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're right. I didn't mention that. Good thing to bring up. I'm just surprised that wasn't in your rundown. I was so sure you were going to bring it up because the mixtaper saw it on some list. And then, you know, I was like, yeah, mixtaper. Remember? Like, we talked about it in the Grammys episode. True. So I was definitely going to bring that up. And then you didn't. And so then I was like, am I wrong? Was it not? <laughs> no, you're right. I wanted to leave it for Connor to bring up. All right. Don't try that crap. I mean, you. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Uh, you know. Let's get the mixtaper out here. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. Hello, mixtaper. I got the blimp. Fueled up and ready to go. Where are we going? You're going to be in the airship over the sea? Yeah, I just figured that's how we'd go discover things. We'd, we'd sail around in the airship. Okay, I like that. Got plenty of snacks in there, plenty of pumpernickel bread, plenty of pumpkin spice lattes for drink, you know, food and drink. Yeah, you're all set. Got everything we need. You're all ready to discover the world. I'm ready to discover some more about the elusive Jeff Mangum and Neutral Milk Hotel. I'm curious... What kind of facts could be out there to find? I don't even know where you'd begin spelunking for details on this. I spelunked into my new favorite cave. Uh-oh. The Reddit cave. Oh, you've been on <laughs> r slash, I don't know, Neutral Milk Hotel, I'm sure. It was very useful about this very niche band. Cult classic. The cult knows things. Yeah. I had to ask the cult for some help. Ask the cult for some help? Did you solicit information or did you just browse? Uh, we don't need to get into that yet. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> They have an unreleased song. At face value, that does not seem unlikely, given kind of the brevity of their lifespan and how much music they probably would have written and recorded. What's it called? I don't think it has a title. Oh, another untitled. Yes, but not the untitled on the album. No, because that would be a released song. Yeah. That'd be a pretty wild one to lie about. <laughs> yeah, no, this is another never officially titled song that was supposed to be on this album. Really? How's it go? What's distinct about it? How can you describe it? It was, well, it was cut because it was too gimmicky. What was gimmicky about it? They tried to write the song using the entire phonetic alphabet. What do you mean? Like a letter for each word? Each, you know, the phonetic alphabet is, you know, oh. there's a word associated with each letter of the alphabet. So Right. Like Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each of the 26 words were going to be in the lyrics. That's awful. Some of the words are impossible. <laughs> well, it was supposed to be set, I guess, on a boat themed song where they were like using different words to communicate i don't know reddit's had some different opinions on exactly what the context of the song was gonna be like what the purpose of the song is other than that gimmick mm. but the basic idea was yeah use the phonetic alphabet in a song i don't know all the parts of the phonetic alphabet but there there are some really hard ones to work into natural lyrics yeah like zulu zulu's hard <laughs> 
Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta? Qu- Quebec? I guess it could have been said in, in Quebec. Yeah. Sierra, I mean, uh, uh, Foxtrot's another rough one. Golf? I think it's a cool concept, but not for this band. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Having listened to the album. Well, so I definitely think it'd be hard to fit into the context. You're right. It does feel too gimmicky for this album. As the history buff that apparently he is writing this whole historical concept album, I get why he was maybe wanting to do it, but I don't think it works. Maybe not, but it also does kind of feel very in theme with like World War II. Maybe not World War II specifically, but like airplanes, right? Oh, that's true. That's true. Airports and air traffic control, they use the phonetic alphabet all the time, even still. That is true. So maybe there's an airplane kind of thing going on or... And apparently the like main version that is like accepted today, the International Phonetic Alphabet or whatever, the NATO version, was established in 1956, which would have been right... I I guess it would have fit. Well, it would have been a little bit late, but yeah. Yeah, close enough to shoehorn it in. It didn't just magically pop into existence in 1956. It was probably being worked on, right? It was probably made so popular and standardized because of World War II. Yeah. Okay. Well, I like this. Factor spin. I think this is the kind of song totally. I mean, you you said it yourself. He's a history minded guy. I think he would have totally thought this idea up because it's kind of off the wall a little bit. And I think he probably would have written the song. And then also, I think he has the discernment to know that it doesn't belong on this album. Mm. So I'm going to call this one a Foxtrot Alpha Charlie Tango. Nice. Thank you. That was good. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) Well, I can confirm that this is indeed a Sierra Papa India November. No. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Oh, I was feeling good about that one. I'm glad you were. That seems like it makes total sense. I didn't feel good about that one. I was afraid you were going to do the classic. You just wanted to make up a fact about the phonetic alphabet. But no, I just, I was looking for other things that were established around the time of World War II to fit with the vibe of the album. And I was like, this is close enough. I really, (laughs) I think you just like incepted me. Because I feel like I had a memory of reading about him or someone trying to write a song with the phonetic alphabet and getting scrapped. I really thought that I had you dead to rights on this. No, okay. Now I'm worried because it also sounded familiar to me. Have I lied about this before and or was it true about somebody before? Because I also, when I came up with this, was like, this sounds familiar. Like, I've used this before. But I couldn't, I was, I shook it off as just like, nah. Maybe not. <laughs> But I had the same deja vu like feeling of like, this sounds familiar. No, you haven't lied about this before. I just thought that's weird. Boy, that's really bizarre. I don't know what's up with that. Up next, he has an expensive favorite cheese. Boy, I don't know if we've ever had a really good cheese fact. What's his favorite cheese? Pool cheese. Can you spell that? (laughs) P-U-L-E. Poule? There's no weird thing over the E, so I'm going to go with pool. Pool? Okay. I just wasn't sure if you like if you said like pool cheese, like P-O-O-L. It's like, that sounds <laughs> awful. Yeah, P-U-L-E. What's expensive about it? Is it like from a special place or made of a special thing? Both. Ooh, do tell. It is produced in the Zasavica Nature Reserve. Z-A-S-A-V-I-C-A. Zasavica. That's a very specific place. It can't be that big if it's a nature reserve. Yeah. And it is made from Balkan donkey milk. Well, so if it's so valuable, why doesn't anywhere else produce that cheese with Balkan donkeys? It is very difficult to produce. And in fact, until this was made, people, apparently the like world operated under the assumption that donkey milk could not be turned into cheese. Oh. Because, quote, the liquid doesn't contain enough cassian to coagulate. It's too liquid. Donkey milk is too liquid to cheese. Yeah. But this is. Is it because of the kind of donkey that it is? Or? Or were we just wrong about all donkeys? No, no. Well, it is mixed with a little bit of goat's milk, which I think gives it what it needs. But it's mainly bulk and donkey milk. I think it just uses a little goat's milk for firmness. Okay. Interesting. And where's that nature preserve at? What country is that in? Zasavica. 
a Serbian cheese. Okay. It's in Serbia. Great. Well, that answers a lot of my questions about the cheese. I guess, except yeah. uh, except for how expensive is it? Oh, well, for that, we're going to have yeah. to play everybody's second favorite game show. Uh, guess that dollar amount. You can't call it everybody's second favorite game show if it's not my second favorite game show. It's your second favorite game show. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to guess the amount per kilogram. What's that in a more American unit? In, in America? What's that in America? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Okay, two pounds of cheese. That's kind of a lot of cheese. I don't know. I'm trying to extrapolate like normal deli cheeses like Swiss or Colby Jack, like what that would be for two pounds. And then what I would consider an expensive cheese based on that baseline. Mm. I think this cheese is probably going to run me 50 to $60 for two and a half pounds. That is nowhere near close. Oh, okay. Well, I, I wasn't sure if this is like the world's most expensive cheese or like just a relatively expensive cheese for him to like. It's pretty much the world's most expensive cheese. Oh, okay. Then I'm going to go closer to... I mean, I could have the world's most expensive cheese just by pulling a craft single out and charging a certain amount for it. Well, so. that's not what it's worth. That's just <laughs> that's how you value it. I think I'm going to say this is then... I guess that that's way too low. 200 bucks a pound. I'm going, I'm going $400 for the... That is way too low. Still? I wouldn't put way on it, but still too low. Okay. I would say it's still significantly low. I guess let's go $1,000? 500 a pound? Roughly. Close. You're close. You're getting closer. My gosh. I had hopes that maybe we'd get to try this cheese someday. I now fear not. I don't think that'll be a possibility. Let's say 1300 for the lot. 1300 per kilogram. You nailed it. Ah, first guess. Yes. It's so expensive because of the difficulty to produce. Yeah, it doesn't sound very easy. It takes 25 liters or six and a half gallons of milk to create one kilogram of cheese. That's so much milk. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they only have a hundred bulk and donkeys that they milk. That's wild. Also, here's a fun fact. Do you know what a male donkey is called? Probably. It's called Jack, right? That's where like right. the other term comes from. Do you know what a female donkey is called? It'd be very funny if it was called a Jill. No, but it's called a Jenny. Oh, I did know that. Yeah, because when I was reading up on this, it said it, they only have a hundred Jennies. And I was like, what the heck is a Jenny? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now that we've answered all the questions about the cheese, let's talk about Neutral Milk Hotel. Yeah. How does he try this cheese? Well, it was rumored he bought the entire supply. How much is the entire supply? I mean, this isn't some big commercial operation. Yeah, I don't have a number for you. I don't. I assume just like whatever they had on hand at the time. He just bought it. He's since denied the rumor, but that's what was rumored. Why deny it? I mean, I guess if he didn't do it and it's just the truth, sure. Because well, but... he... Wait, what? <laughs> If he didn't do it, sure. But like, <laughs> I'll be honest. If I didn't do it, but somebody accused me of it, I'd say yeah. I'd probably still say yeah. I got all the expensive cheese. Yeah, I don't know how much. It's just that was the rumor. But how did he know that he liked it? Uh, I don't know. Man, this is tough. Apparently, the cheese has a combination of nutty and earthy flavors, accompanied by a crumbly texture. I'm not a crumbly cheese guy. I don't know if I'd like this cheese. I don't know, but like blue cheese is crumbly. That's really the only crumbly cheese I've tried. Feta? Oh, come on. No feta. Yeah, I'm not a big feta. I'm fed up with feta all right wow are you cool with pool i don't know if i'm cool with pool i'm not a crumbly cheese guy i mean i try it world's most expensive cheese say i do to blue i'm fed up with feta not cool with pool <laughs> it's probably not even pronounced pool and we'll get all kinds of comments about how to properly say pule or something there's no symbol over the e so it can't have the, that sound anyway i don't know what to make of this and i think i'm gonna say it's a spin yeah yeah i think i'm gonna say it's a spin this is a spin yes okay now i almost accused you of just finding out about a really cool cheese and wanting to talk about it on the podcast yeah i knew you did and that's not what happened i also almost half assumed that you looked at this album cover and well, i mean we'll talk about it in a minute but the woman's head that's a tambourine uh -huh. almost looks like a big wheel of cheese and i almost thought that was a <laughs> way that this could have happened yeah no. I was reading about Serbian professional tennis player uh, Novak De Djokovic. Djokovic, that's it. Yeah, he's the one that's rumored to have purchased the entire supply. Well, he's rich and famous and Serbian, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And he's really good at tennis, <laughs> which isn't relevant, but cool. Yeah. Well, look at us, 50-50 on the year of discovery. I don't think we should set any more year-long goals for ourselves, by the way. No, I don't think we should. <laughs> that was pretty stressful. I think we just let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. To keep us healed, probably best if we don't. Now that we've gotten both of those out of the way, I had to get those out of the way first before the other two facts influenced them in any way, because I only really found 
two interesting facts interesting enough to bring in my deep dive oh and so those two were just me making up facts about their name yeah that's the other thing milk and cheese was really to milk right yeah and then the h in the phonetic alphabet is hotel oh smart yeah i knew that <laughs> intuitively but did not even connect those dots when you listen back to this you'll realize that as you got farther into the alphabet trying to remember it i kept trying to change the topic harder and harder because i didn't want you to get the h and say hotel and go wait a second <laughs> You got all the way to G, and I was like, so anyway. Well, you fed me Foxtrot. I forgot about Echo in the moment. Yeah, I was trying to, like, get you off of the, off of the, trying to remember the alphabet as quickly as possible. So these are the two allegedly real facts that also could totally not be real. Allegedly real, yeah. These have all been, they all started out as alleged facts, but these two are the real deal, fake deal. Well, these two were specifically spins based around their name. These other two have nothing to do with their name, whether they're true or not. Okay. He can play a weird instrument. Yes, he can. I don't know if you're foreshadowing things that I intended to talk about later in the episode or not. Uh, well, but I also learned about a weird instrument in my research of this album. Go ahead. What weird instrument? Well, I learned a lot about the singing saw. What is that? Great. Well, well, Connor and I will talk about that later and you could hear it. That's a tease for later in the episode. What instrument did you learn about? He can play the shortwave radio. The shortwave radio. Yeah. Is that... That's not really an instrument. I guess it kind of is. It can be if you're using it as an instrument. You, anything can be an instrument if you use it as one. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like literally an instrument, like a like a tool <laughs> instead of a musical instrument. That's like a like a tool for a function. Oh. So, but he's using it like a musical instrument, right? Yeah. What's he doing? Playing music. Yeah, yeah. But is he doing like radio static? You know the radio, like sometimes when you, in the olden days, the olden radios, you could turn the dial real quick and get those like wobbly tones well you tell me because he's credited with it on this album credited with playing the shortwave radio yeah you hear any shortwave radio on on this album well obviously i might have <laughs> It's honestly, that's hard to tell. I think any sound that a shortwave radio does make, if you throw it into this mixing bowl of compression and distortion, it's going to start to blend really well. If I am looking, though, if I'm, I'm thinking if I'm looking to create an album that sounds compressed and distorted, that kind of background noise, like radio static or maybe, I don't know, just transmission sounds or whatever it is, I think that's going to add to the album really well and seamlessly. Mm. I kind of think this is true. I know there, like I said, a lot of weird instruments on this album, a lot of artistic choices. A lot of eccentricity here. So you're going with true? Well, I don't know if I want to lock it in yet because also, oh, I don't know, shortwave radio was a big thing in World War II, which could just, I mean, historically be a thing while you picked it. You went and looked for World War II things and found shortwave radio, but also could be a reason that he specifically included it on this album. Good point. Yeah, I don't know which way to go. Ugh. <laughs> I'm going to lock in fact. I think I am. Locking in fact. I think this is too risky of a thing for you to lie about. Because you know I've done all kinds of research about this album. If it helps at all, I took a peek at your notes just to make sure it wasn't in there. You know? <laughs> I popped in, did a control F, and typed in radio. And just looked for anywhere that you would have doubt the word radio. Which you had done a couple of times. But nothing in relation to this. Well, that either means... I mean, if you were looking for it, that sounds like it was true. And you expected me to maybe have found it. Yeah. Well, I asked if that... I said, I said that might have helped. Oh, yeah. You also might not have done that. <laughs> I guess I don't even know. But yeah, I'm locking in fact. I'm just going to have to stick to my guns on this one. Because it could go either way. And I don't know. So I'm saying fact. This is... A true fact. Oh, heck yeah. It's one of those things that I came across the fact about the shortwave radio and the saw. And I saw they weren't in the rundown and went, does he not know? I said, there's no way he doesn't know about this. But it's not in the rundown. I have to check. <laughs> I did a search for saw and radio in your notes quickly. So you did know about the saw. Yeah. <laughs> well, more about that upcoming. <laughs> Connor doesn't know about it. No, I'll teach him. So anyway, we got one left. One left. Okay. This is exciting. What a good first round in the year of Discovery in Season 8. He did a photo shoot with an expensive item. If it's a wheel of cheese, I'm kind of going to be upset. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, Jeff Mangum, expensive item, photo shoot. I mean, obviously the first question has to be, what's the expensive item? A chess set. An expensive chess set. This is really annoying. Okay. When I came onto the call with you today, you remember one of the first things you said to me? You said I was trying to play chess, but couldn't find single player chess. Oh, oh, I guess I did. Yeah. Hmm. 
Okay, so that, I mean, could mean that you were influenced to want to play chess by finding this fact or lying about it. I don't know. That, I guess I can't take it to mean too much. Anyway, what's so expensive about the chess set that he is doing a photo shoot with? It's a giant chess set, first off. Takes up like an entire table. That's pretty big. It comes with a chess set, a table, and two chairs to sit at while playing it. Big pieces. Okay, but this is like a commercially available chess set? Yeah, you can buy one right now. How expensive is it? Oh, well, for that, we're going to have to return to everybody's Not secondary twice. game show. Oh. Yeah, twice in one episode. Woo! Guess that dollar amount. I will give you a hint, and you'll take a guess. And then if you don't get it, I'll describe the chess set a little, and maybe that'll help. Oh, I was going to ask questions about it. Your hint is that it is more expensive than the cheese. Wow. <laughs> That's wild. I'll accept questions after your first guess. Oh, man. $4,500. Significantly more. Significantly? Way low. Okay. What's it made out of? It's handmade in lost wax cast 24 karat gold and silver finished bronze. Yeah, that wouldn't have been my guess if I had known that. And that's why I wanted to ask a question first. <laughs> well, that's why I wanted to guess first. The game is rigged. <laughs> and then if you want the table and chairs, this is your other hint, it'll cost you $10,000 more because the table and chairs are also gold and marble. Gold and marble? Like It's like a marble top with like golden legs. Oh my gosh. This chess set would make my floor sag. <laughs> I assume they're not solid gold legs, but... No, but marble is not that light. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I'm not really concerned about gold plating. <laughs> okay, well, that's going to up my guess significantly. Mm -hmm. It's a table-sized chessboard. Remember, they're giant pieces, too. Yeah, how big are the pieces? They're also giant pieces made out of silver and gold. I don't know. They... Just, like, eyeball it. I don't know. Are they, like, the size of a forearm? And I got it, I got it, I got it. The king is 10.24 inches tall, and its base is 3.15 inches wide. It's almost a foot tall. Yeah. Yeah, it's a gold and silver bronze chest stool that is 34 by 34 by 48. That's in centimeters. And then the table is 51 inches by 32 inches by 23 inches. I don't know, $17,000. Way too low. Still? Remember, the table itself is 10000 Yeah, table and chairs. That's the most expensive part, probably. No, it's not. <laughs> that's the biggest part. It is not. I mean, marble, like, your countertops are made, can be made out of marble and stuff, right? Sure. And then, you're like, these chess pieces are, like, 24 karat gold and silver. And, like solid? Yeah, yeah. These are, like, ornate. I don't know, 120000 <laughs> Closer. This is ridiculous. Guess that dollar amount is one thing when it's, like, a guessable <laughs> number. <laughs> you say it's a chess set it costs six hundred thousand dollars like i can't work with that <laughs> for the table and chair combo it costs one hundred fifty six thousand nine hundred and five dollars one hundred fifty six thousand you say and we could buy that right now yeah amazing you can send it to either yourself or other and add a new name below <laughs> i can add it to my cart how many will let me add <laughs> What a gift. <laughs> I'm still going. I'm at 40 to my cart right now. Hang on. Don't. 50. You're going to get in trouble. So you're going to click something you don't mean to click. And we're going to have to like mortgage your house or something. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it'll let me go past 100. Can I go to 999? That's a million dollars. 999 items in my cart. Whoever hand makes those pieces <laughs> is going to swear as soon as they get that order. <laughs> One hundred and fifty six million seven hundred forty eight thousand ninety five dollars. One hundred fifty million dollars <laughs> you put in your cart right now. Wow. Yeah. Just a cool one hundred fifty million for nine hundred ninety nine. Well, let me put in one more after that. But, hey, now I got a thousand. No, I will not be proceeding to check out. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can build a house out of all your chess tables. Does he own his table? Surely he's just at one he's gone to where one is yeah i think he's just at one where is it no idea why is he doing pictures with it it depicts the battle of charlemagne versus the moors oh so it's like a very specifically crafted it's not a normal set of chess pieces no they look like historical figures and yeah no i'm saying this is a spin i think this is not true you ask like where the photos came from or okay sure well where'd they come from on reddit <laughs> <laughs> okay he like did black and white photos of himself like sitting at the table like quizzically looking at the board like he was gonna make a move you know it was like uh, a whole little spread of photos in black and white of him with this table which honestly i get like the aesthetic choice of black and white but like you can't tell it's like gold and silver and bronze if it's in black and white that's true kind of poor choice yeah i think i'm sticking with spin here I'm sticking with spin yeah well this is a table that you can go apparently online and order digitally right now mm -hmm. and i don't know i just feel like
like Jeff Mangum's been out of the public eye for so long. I don't know. Uh, is he doing photo shoots for publicity? Is this just something he posted for fun? I feel like he doesn't have much of a, a digital footprint nowadays. So I feel like this is either really old or like really specifically to promote the Neutral Milk Hotel reunion in 2013 through 15. Or maybe I'm just wrong. But I think it's a spin. Maybe you're just wrong because this is a true spin. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you had me there for a minute. Did I? Good. I don't always get you with those. Uh, yeah, this is a spin. Unfortunate. How'd you end up with this? So this was a real instance of me learning about something and wanting to bring it to the podcast. Oh, man. I was one off. I didn't think you would believe the chess that I actually learned about. Fun fact, this is number eight on a list of the world's most expensive chess sets eight yeah oh my gosh the number one chess set that i learned about is the most expensive chess set in the world it's called the jewel royal chess set designed by boodles which is an awesome name boodles boodles like poodles but with a b <laughs> the king's piece itself is valued at over a hundred and forty thousand dollars whoa <laughs> The chess set has inlays of 16 karat gold, dozens of rubies, and spirals of diamonds. The original Jewel Royal chess set was commissioned for $1.2 million and is now worth $9.8 million. That's so much money. <laughs> Yeah, this is the chess set that I spun about. Mm, yeah, if I had seen it, I also wouldn't have believed it, I think. Yeah, that's why I didn't show it to you. <laughs> well, fair enough. Well, boy, did I ever need a week like this. Yeah. I haven't had a week where I've scored more points than you since episode 149. Oh, wow. It's been a bit. Well, we had to go on that tear to get you even with, you know, the 50-50 thing. Anyway. you, I was ahead. Who knew? <laughs> also, be honest, was this the reason you talked about playing chess when I showed up? No. Oh, it was totally unrelated. Well, I played chess yesterday, and then that made me want to learn about this chess set, and that made me want to spin about this chess set. Okay. I've just been in a chess phase. You know what would be kind of fun? To make a spin it A spin chess it chess board. Don't you worry, I had the same thought. <laughs> I kind of figured you might have. Well, Mixtaper, here's to a wonderful eighth season of Factor Spin. Hey, I'll drink a pumpkin spice latte to that. The Milk Hotel might be neutral, and I know you never are. Yeah! Welcome back, Connor. And here I thought we were past this. Past what? Welcoming me back, even though I've been here the whole time. No, you've been here. I'm just welcoming you back to the microphone. So we had a whole year to heal. No, and... it's, it's not for you. I don't welcome you back for you. I welcome you back for the audience so they know that your voice isn't the mixtaper doing your voice. Oh, that's right, because he does my voice. Yeah. I would know that if, if I was here. If you were here. here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think myself left. That's good. Ready to talk about some album art? I sure am. Are you? You kind of already did. You mentioned how it kind of looks like cheese. Yeah. What was your initial? I don't mean to taint your initial impression, but like. I'll be honest. I went tambourine followed by coconut mm. back to tambourine. See, the probably coconuts are like hollow, but I get yeah, I see where you're coming from. Well, because the the shading in the middle kind of makes it look depressed. It looks depressed in the middle. I For a brief moment, I went coconut, but then I went back to tambourine. Yeah. I also think like slice of potato a lot when I look at it. Oh, slice of potato is a good one. That is that is good. Yeah. The other other thing that always gets me is it has the colonel sanders effect <laughs> does it you know you know what i'm talking about well how the ascot around her neck kind of looks like a small body yeah it's got like the two like aren't like, like they're posed like uh, almost mirrored to how she's actually posed with one hand up and one hand down and then a dress like she's wearing so it was kind of like the, the the little necktie thing looks like a little body so then i was like oh small body big head so i was on that for a little bit too but i settled on the correct okay fantastic yeah the cover of in the airplane over the sea i mean it intrigued me right away it's bizarre it features four people out in the ocean swimming there's a woman in a red dress sitting on the dock are they swimming or drowning back there because it kind of looks like drowning it does look like drowning i think they're swimming is that a shipwreck like what's all the stuff in the water yeah there's ships back there one's like a steamship yeah and then the other's a sailboat well no but like the stuff not as far back as the boat oh uh, i think that's just shading i think is that shading it looked like pieces of debris De uh, debris. that's how us americans say debris it's not <laughs> and that mixed with just heads above the water and nothing else it kind of made me think shipwreck drowning i don't know i was i was in a dark place while looking at this you know maybe it's not just shading i guess i've always thought of it as shading because i just have and a lot of it lines up with like the position of the boats and stuff well we knew world war ii vibe i was like maybe you know like naval battle yeah well i'm looking at the little bit of stuff like right underneath 
the kid's arm and that looks like it's causing a splash so you know what they might be solid objects in the water i don't know i don't know but her head is definitely is replaced with a tambourine up close if you look at it jeff mangum if you couldn't tell loves that old-timey turn of the 20th century type stuff circus aesthetics right what have you all that what have you the whole cover of on avery island is circus tents and merry-go-rounds so he kind of explores that vintage aesthetic a little further here can we talk about how ugly the the child's shirt is it's a pretty ugly swimsuit yes is it a swimsuit who put who does who wears a green and beige striped swimsuit with a yellow star smack dab in the middle of it i know this kid does also i'm i've zoomed in on this Uh uh-huh i'm quite zoomed in right now like and i got a big ultra wide monitor so i am very you're so zoomed in (laughs) i'm very zoomed in right now yeah there's no body on that head. That's a decapitated head right there. With the one on the right? Yeah, there's no neck. No, you, the lump on the right of him kind of looks like a shoulder to me, but like underwater. Absolutely not. Well, yeah. Well, the fashion and everything and the strange look of it, the almost uncanny valley vibe, is probably because this image, the original one, is from a postcard made in the early 1900s. Oh. Also, whoever did this was really proud of their ability to do lips. <laughs> Look at that boy. He's Look at that child. Got good lips. Kind of an uncanny valley face, but those lips all puckered up and I don't know, just like very stand out the red on those lips. Yeah. They were like, "Look at these lips. Look at this potato head and lips." Well, the potato head was it wasn't on the original postcard. Or er, oh, oh, it wasn't. No, it's just a normal like the woman has a real head. Well, listen. This guy was coming along and he's like, "I need an artist." who is really good at sliced potatoes and lips. And this guy went, finally, my time has come. (laughs) (laughs) This is my moment. Well, the lips guy was the original guy who did the 1900s poster. And the band hired Chris Bilheimer to do the album's cover and the artwork. He did a lot of the aesthetics. Did he Photoshop or did he like recreate it? Because if so, he's also good at lips. No, he added the tambourine himself. And then he also threw a bunch of dirt on the picture, which you can see in the top Uh, left, especially. Yep, 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 yep. Maybe he added the lips. I think the lips are on the original picture. Maybe he made them stand out more. Maybe he did. (laughs) Maybe he's the lip and potato guy. (laughs) He was like, these lips don't pop. (laughs) Hold on. There's the original. Hey, let me zoom in on them lips. Hang on. Oh, man, cut a whole person out of it. Dang. He did. I think we've also maybe talked about Chris Bilheimer before because he's also worked pretty closely with R.E.M. And he's also worked with Weezer and Green Day and a few other bands since. But what he said was, he said, the guys in Neutral Milk Hotel lived just down the street from me. I actually briefly lived in the house they were renting. When I started working on Aeroplane, Jeff Mangum came to me with a whole bunch of different images that he wanted to use. My biggest challenge was to make them all fit together as a whole. He said the cover came from a vintage postcard that we altered. I scanned the backside of the postcard and used that paper texture on all the other elements as a way to make them seem that they came from the same time and place and it worked out really well that's impressive yeah so whenever you see artwork from in the airplane over the sea you know that the texturing comes from the back of the cover image wow it's pretty wild i think it's a great aesthetic for this this record i think it is just weird enough to catch your eye and your attention it's old just kind of matches the the feeling and the flow of this whole album. All right. Well, I think we've talked about this album hard enough. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Let's get into it. Let's get into the airplane over the sea. The album kicks off with the King of Carrot Flowers, part one. Do we think he's responsible for selling all those carrots to Aerosmith? (laughs) Maybe. I don't know. The King of Carrot Flowers, what do you think? What uh, Did you have expectations for this album? A band called Neutral Milk Hotel? I really didn't. Yeah, just coming in cold. I listened to it before the mixtaper could give me any details from his factory search. Oh, wow. And so I went into it completely blind. How's it hit? I wish I could listen to this album for the first time again and have that initial experience, but I'm going to have to live vicariously through you. It's like a sack of potatoes. Oh, fantastic. I like that we start with just an acoustic guitar. I think so much of this album is born from just an acoustic guitar. And so I think it's a really appropriate place to start. I think the King of Care Flowers part one is probably one of the happier sounding sections of this album, instrumentally, musically. Yeah. And so I think that's good. I like the synth. Is it a synth or is it just distortion making it sound like a synth? I don't know. Can't tell. No, there's no synthesizers here. What you're probably talking about is the accordion. Oh, the distorted accordion. It's whatever instrument is being held over from part one to part two and parts two and three. Oh. Probably the accordion. The droning instrumental that's between one and two. It was actually a happy accident. The producer, Rob Schneider, was actually asked about it, and he 
said he immediately mentioned this song and the part where Julian's amplified fuzz pedaled banjo comes in right after the drums. He said it's a woozy effect achieved by bowing the strings. So that's what it is. That's why you think it's a synth and don't recognize it. It's a bow on an out of tune banjo with a distortion pedal. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. To be fair, you distort anything enough, it sounds like a synth. So that's fair. Rob Schneider said it really bugged me that it was out of tune, but Julian really liked it and Jeff liked it. And Jeff's not looking for tuning and stuff like that. But now listening to it, I hear that it has a raw, almost Eastern quality of being out of tune. I really love the lyrics on King of Care. Well, in the whole album. I'll say it the whole album and I don't want to get redundant, but I'll just say it at the top. Wow. Lyrically, what a tumultuous emotional lyrical scene. It, it contains a lot of references to, you know, tarot cards like the tower. There's all kinds of evocative and obscure imagery that really, I think it elicits an emotion without being something that's relatable at all. Like mom would stick a fork into daddy's shoulder. Like no one's ever, most of us have never seen that, but we all, like that makes you feel something, doesn't it? I think we all just understand the concept of a fork is pointy and we know what shoulders are and how squishy they are. Yeah, that's true. But there's even like just all kinds of random, you built a tower tumbling through the trees in holy rattlesnakes that fell all around your feet. That doesn't mean anything, but it feels like something. And that's what this whole album does best. It gives us a lot of disconnected words and images that don't connect to each other, but they really connect with you as the listener. And I like that a lot. And then I also love the contrast between, you know, forks into the shoulder and throwing garbage across the floor, but then we, like, lay and learn what each other's bodies were for. There's this contrast between him growing up in this violent situation, but then also, like, experiencing adolescence and coming of age at that same time. And there's just a lot. I honestly, I could sing the certified poetry praises of almost every lyric on this album. Sinking into the secret place in your soul where no one dares to go. It's pretty solid. It's a solid opening track. Yeah, I think so. Are you trying to play your cards close to the chest again? <laughs> no, I feel like I said several things about that song. You did. I know. What do you want me to do? Be like, yes, that lyric is meaningless. And yes, that lyric is... I mean, I, I commented on your whole fork thing. I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm too deep into the cult. That's all it is. Fair enough. I think this is a hard... This, I forget how heavy this album could be to digest <laughs> on a first listen going in so cold with nothing. Because I don't know if this is an album that I gravitated towards or took to after one listen, or if it took a couple. I can't even remember. But I feel like it was a few listens before it, like, clicks. Anyway, yeah, King of Carrot Flowers Part 1 rolls very smoothly, thanks to that accordion and all those production tricks. It rolls very smoothly into the King of Carrot Flowers Parts 2 and 3, which are connected in one track, even though they are individually separate parts. Part 2 has alternately earned the nickname Jesus Christ. Superstar. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> different. Very different. Now, is he actually saying he loves Jesus or is he like exclaiming, Jesus Christ, I love you? See, that's, I don't know. There's a lot of room for interpretation. And that's why I think he got so many questions about his lyrics and he got so sick of trying to explain himself. Maybe the speaker is discovering religion. Maybe it's not really like relational religion that he's discovering. Maybe he's just using it as a rock to get him through the chaos of the life we learned about in Carrot Flowers Part 1. Maybe it's, yeah, like you said, maybe it's exclaiming, proclaiming your love for someone else with exasperation. Who knows? What he said was, since this seems to confuse people, I'd like to simply say that I mean what I sing, although the theme of Endless Endless on this album is not based on any religion, but more in the belief that all things seem to contain a white light within them that I see as eternal. So maybe it's just about the nature of things. The world goes and always waits the day we're awaiting. Like, maybe it's just this limbo, the state of limbo. <laughs> I don't know. It's unclear. The line that I think most confuses me, it's a toss up, but a good contender for a line that most confuses me uh -huh. is I will float until I learn how to swim inside my mother in a garbage bin. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that means. I know. <laughs> Like, even if you had the context, like, I get swim. So, through the wave and undertow, I will float until I learn how to swim. Like, I get where the swimming's coming in with the waves. But then he just throws in inside my mother in a garbage bin. What does that mean? Until I find myself again. When maybe it's this, I don't know, image of rebirth there. Something like that. Like, I could see, like, I will float in a garbage bin. 
until I learn how to swim, like through the waves, like bobbing in the waves. And the guards are, well, where's the mother coming into this? Well, she brought him into this world. Maybe she's trying to rebring him into the world, but the world is just a garbage bin. <laughs> like, life sucks. He's trying to learn how to swim. So confused. It's a confusing line. <laughs> That's part of King of Carrot Flowers Part 3. Part 3, or as it's colloquially called. Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say Inside My Mother. No, it's not called that. It's called Up and Over. That's actually <laughs> what it's called. It's also been called Up and Over We Go. That's what it's really called. And it used to actually exist independently of this album. It was from an earlier release that they did called Invent Yourself a Shortcake. And it recycles lyrics from an earlier song, a track from Hype City Soundtrack called Synthetic Flying Machine. I really like the contrast. Like part one of King of Carrot Flowers is very rhythmic, right? There's a guitar, there's an accordion. It's very like well paced and rhythmic. And then part two, the accordion is still there. The guitar goes away and it's like slow. It ebbs and it flows a lot more. It's it's ethereal and ambient. It's relaxed. And then suddenly we get to up and over and the accordion goes away and all the guitars and the drums come in and it's loud and it's chaotic and it shakes you around and it's a whole mess. I really like up and over we go though. I really like part three. The melody is pretty fun. On writing it, Mangum said, a lot of us were really lost at that point in our lives and we were all pretty scared. So I wrote that song for everybody to sort of say, everything's going to be all right. Don't be afraid. Most of my songs were recorded for friends. A friend would be depressed or having a hard time and I'd write a pop song. I don't know if there's a pop song, but okay. I'd write a pop song for them to make them feel better. Got troubles? You know, we're going to go up and over them. Through the waves, through the undertow, we're going to float. We're going to stay alive. We're going to rise above all the difficulties and all our problems. And I think it's cool that we transition from that song about going up and over into a song about airplanes with track three in the aeroplane over the sea a title track title track title track how do you feel about the old spelling of airplane aeroplane it's not one you see a lot nowadays no but i feel like it's one that i i don't know why i do this but i like to pronounce airplane that way when i'm like not just like a normal like i want to be like oh i don't know i guess i'm not using the word airplane very often but <laughs> Like, there's just something fun about saying aeroplane that, like, if I'm, like, at a museum or something, I'm like, oh, look at the aeroplane. Or the aeroport. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just, I feel like I say aeroplane way more than I've seen the word aeroplane still used. Yeah, that's fair. I like it a lot. That extra syllable is fun. And he uses the extra syllable in the melody. Aeroplane over the sea. Like, it plays a part in the rhythm. Mm -hmm. So I guess it, it all works out. Here's a fun fact. Jeff Mangum wrote this song instantaneously. He was not in the studio, not doing anything. He was hanging out with some friends, and he just stood up. He said, I gotta go. I got a song in my head. And he ran off, and he grabbed his guitar and just sat down and played the song in full, pretty much. I wish I could make music like that. How fun must that be? I... I'm pretty certain I'd heard this song. Really? You'd heard Airplane? I, I don't know where or why. I'm pretty certain I've heard a cover of this song used in a TV show, and I'm trying to find it. Oh. Well, I actually also didn't mention and thought you might bring up at some point. Nutrimilk Hotel does get a shout out on a very popular recent sitcom does it? that I know you know. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I also know Ezra Koenig knows it. It's mentioned on Parks and Rec. Oh, is it? Yeah. It's the scene where like Tom invents a newlywed game for Andy and April to play and he asks them what their favorite band is and Andy's like, oh, it's easy. Her favorite band is Mouse Rat, right? The band that he's in. And she says, no, it's Neutral Milk Hotel. And they get into a fight over it. It's a whole thing. Oh. I thought you might recognize the band from that, but that's a pretty small reference. I think I found it. Yeah! Yeah, I found it. I can't. The internet's a glorious place. Uh, apparently. You know who Matt Pond is? I don't. Have you heard of the show called The OC? No. Wait, what? Really? Really, no. You never heard of The OC? No. So The OC is an American teen drama television series created by Josh Schwartz that originally aired on the Fox Network from 2003 to 2007. I was like six. Why would I have heard of this? Yeah, I know, but I don't know. Just you've watched older shows. We have a total of four seasons consisting of 92 episodes. The series title OC is the initialism of Orange County. Anyway, in like the credit sequence for one of their episodes, there's a cover of this song used, the chorus, and one day we will die and our ashes will fly from the airplane over the sea. That part. What an incredible lyric. When we hit the chorus, and I was like, I recognize this. <laughs> it's a, it, hey, it's a lyric that leaves an impression when you hear it. Well, that's wild. Took me a minute to track it down because it's not their version. It's a cover done by Matt Pond. 
the things that you know. I mean, you you could talk about Otis elevators all you want, but sometimes you get stuff like that that just blows my mind. <laughs> and it doesn't surprise me that there are covers of this song because it's popular. I mean, as a title track and as just a good song. Consequence of Sound actually ranked in the Airplane Over the Sea the 18th best song of all time in 2012. And it's also earned pretty high rankings on best of lists from Germany's Music Express, WOXY, and a lot more. So it gets some recognition. Probably one of the two most popular or well-known tracks from this album. And allegedly one of the most Anne Frank heavy tracks as well. People suspect he got a lot of inspiration here. It just has such a catchy chorus. Oh, really? It does. And a great bridge. I mean, to that point, too. The bridge is perfect for this song. Yeah. And I just, I don't know. I just can't believe some of the lyrics. They leave me a little stunned. Just in, like, the way that he thinks about the world. What a beautiful face I've found in this place that's circling around the sun. He doesn't say, wow, I've met the prettiest girl on earth. He says, I found you in this place circling around the sun. It's just such a cool way to translate emotions. Like that set of words comes with a whole different emotional pull than the most normal way to say it. Also, I need to give a shout out to the way he sings soft and sweet. Yeah, it's not actually very soft and sweet the way that he sings it. It's kind of hard and abrasive a little bit. Sharp. He sings it not in tone, not in pitch, but like crisp. Soft and sweet. <laughs> I just, I mean, all of verse two that you talked about. Yeah. One day we'll die in our ashes. We'll fly from the airplane over the sea. Yeah. And it's nuts that that's the verse. Yeah. It feels like it should be the chorus, <laughs> but it's not. No. Let us lay in the sun and count every beautiful thing we can see love to be. Ah. It's awesome. It has such a good cadence to it. Yeah, this song is almost the epitome of the album for me, but not even quite. I think there's still more. I also really love kind of towards the end of the song, when we meet on a cloud, I'll be laughing out loud, laughing with everyone I see. I can't believe how strange it is to be anything at all. And I love the repetition of circling around the sun from verse one to verse four. It ties it all together. How strange it is to be. Life is bizarre and we're stuck in it. Let's try and find the beautiful things in it before it's too late. And this is the song that features that brand new instrument for us, a singing saw. If you had to guess what the singing saw is, what would you guess? If I had to guess? Yes. Uh, let's see. I would say it is a handsaw used as a musical instrument capable of continuous glissando. The sound creates an ethereal tone very similar to the theremin. It's true. That's right. It's literally a saw that they take a bow and play on the flat side of the saw. And that's why it can glissando like it does. And then you know how like when you shake a piece of sheet metal, it makes that wobbly noise? Mm -hmm. That's the principle of it, but with a violin bow. And like the thunder, like the thunder sheet. Yeah, apparently it's got its roots in Russia and in vaudeville performances. Actually, the musical saw is classified as a plaque friction idophone with direct friction under the Horbestal Sox system of musical instrument classification. What don't you know? <laughs> and as a metal sheet, Sheet played by friction under the revision of the Hornbastel sock classification by the Memo Consortium. Yeah, I think that's a little advanced for our purposes, but it's good to be informed. Oh, you want something a little less advanced? Okay, well, mainly, basically, it's just a flexible handsaw played by holding the handle between the knees and bending the blade while bowing along the flat edge. Bingo. The saw is generally played seated with the handle squeezed between the legs. Okay, okay, you talked and... about, you said that exact same thing. <laughs> the other thing I learned is that in the early 1900s, there were 10 companies in the United States making musical saws, not just like saws, specifically saws for music. 10 companies made them. Heck yeah. Today, there are about three that remain. And outside the US, Baco, the same company who makes Stradivarius violins, makes musical saws too. <laughs> and actually, I also learned that in June of 2022, the musical saw was used to play the national anthem at an Oakland A's baseball game. That's awesome. Yeah. Wasn't awesome enough to keep them in Oakland, but whatever. Apparently, you're supposed to play the saw with the serrated edge or teeth facing your body, though some players face them away and or file down the teeth, which makes no discernible difference to the sound, but does make you a little baby. So uh, <laughs> A wimp. The... <laughs> you're a wimp if you file down the teeth of your saw. You gotta get nicks and cuts. And, of course... If you play the musical saw, you are a sawist. Sawist. Nice. That is that is the term for somebody who plays the musical saw. Imagine waking up one day. You're in a room bound and chained to a strange device. A videotape comes on. Do you want to play some music? <laughs> it's so wobbly and weebly and weird and fun. Wibbly, wobbly, woobly, whoop. 
Yeah. Well, that's enough saw tangent. <laughs> but -na 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 -na. let's talk about two headed boy. You could use a saw to turn him into a normal boy. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Well, that's uh in terms of the metaphor <laughs> that this song is, that's even worse and really makes me cringe. <laughs> it's a very thinly veiled sexual metaphor, I think. He's not got two necks, if you know what I'm saying. Oh. Right. He does have two necks. Well, so the point is, <laughs> it's a, a very metaphorical kind of song. Very subtly, or not so subtly, sexual in nature and interesting. And it's a little more stripped back than the cacophony we're coming from, with musical saws and loud, chaotic drums and up and over and all that. Two-Headed Boy is really just like an acoustic guitar, pretty much the whole time. One of my favorite lines in the song, and we'll come back to it later, is in verse 3. The two-headed boy with pulleys and weights is creating a radio played just for two, playing music made for his lover who's floating and choking with her hands across her face. I have a question. Is this a hot take? Well, I'm going to need to know what the take is first. They remind me of Radiohead uh, in their sound. Not the hottest of takes. We're talking about, I mean, alt bands in the 90s. I think there are some comparisons that can be drawn. Just especially the beginning of this song, the first two-headed boy, gave me real creep vibes. I mean, to be fair, Radiohead is a lot more than creep, and I think a lot of this album is a, is not a lot like most of Radiohead. No, I agree. But, yeah, I think there are some comparisons to be made, especially lyrically. Radiohead is just creep. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Radiohead also does these little lyrical fragments and images. Uh-huh, yeah, yes, correct. I mean, you remember, we talked on episode 53 about two colors in my head every day i'm sucking on a lemon sucking on a lemon yep yep radiohead does all kinds of those little images that I do just, emotion. I, got, I got radiohead vibes that's not good that's not something i like to hear you say to be honest you gave radiohead like a pitiful two but again this is very different from radiohead and especially kid a in a lot of ways two-headed boy is the longest song on the album to this point and the third longest song that we'll see over the course of the album does this length bother you at all no not really it went by pretty fast i think it does i agree up next the fool a good old-fashioned instrumental. instrumental yeah i like the fool it kind of sounds like a military march again very apt for an album so vaguely world war ii-esque apparently its sound and style is also very reminiscent of jazz-filled New Orleans and funerals that happened there that Jeff would witness as he was growing up. I like it. I thought you might. What about those horns? Some good horns. Yeah. What's the high-pitched thing? Is that a flute that's been distorted? You can hear it pretty prevalently around the 130 mark, but it's basically there the whole time in the background. It's a good question. I can't tell if that's a harmonica or a shortwave radio <laughs> or what. <laughs> <laughs> but... It's definitely pretty high-pitched. They use all kinds of weird instruments on this album. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it was almost anything. Fair enough. It's also worth mentioning. I mean, it's an instrumental. Not a ton to say about it. I like the discordant sound of it. But it's also worth mentioning that the Fool is yet another tarot card symbol, like the Tower that was mentioned in earlier tracks. A little more symbolism. How about that? Yeah. So I said that In the Airplane Over the Sea is almost the apex of the album. And I mean, it's definitely got the most Spotify plays. Maybe it's the most popular or well-known, but I think that's just the consequence of it being the title track and being way more palatable to the average listener than Holland 1945, which I think is really the album's biggest and best moment. Like of everything it has to offer, Holland 1945 kind of seems to be the epitome of it. It was the band's second ever single, the only single to come from In the Airplane Over the Sea, and therefore, the last Neutral Milk Hotel single for more than a decade. Going out with a bang, I guess. And it was also actually one of the last songs Jeff Mangum wrote for the album. And he didn't even give it a title until it was almost done. Much like the untitled track later on this album and the phonetic alphabet song that never existed. It was an untitled track. The album was almost ready. Still didn't have a name. But art director Chris Bilheimer, the tambourine and lip man, he said, you can't just leave it untitled. Like, what do you want to call it in the liner notes of the album? What should I write? Jeff said, hmm, I don't know. Maybe I would call it 1945. Maybe I'd call it Holland. And Bilheimer said, why not both? Yeah, Bilheimer said, what if you smush them together? And that's what they did. It ended up being quite a hit. Pitchfork deemed it the number seven best song of the 90s back in 2010. We didn't talk about it on our 90s episode. I don't think it would have quite fit in with the bunch of songs that we ended up with. I don't think it would have either. <laughs> Britney Spears, Meatloaf, 
and this, Holland 1945. What do you think about it? It's definitely the most distorted of the songs. I like it. Yeah? I, I had a rockin' time. It is. I like all the horn section, all the trumpet and horn parts they put in the back of it. Yeah. It's definitely got some of the most gruesome kind of lyrics here. Yeah, but if you ignore those, it's a good time. No, I mean, it's. I think the lyrics add a lot to it. Holland 1945 was not exactly the happiest place in the world to be. True. We ride the circus wheel with your dark brother wrapped in white. Says it was good to be alive, but now he rides a comet's flame and won't be coming back again. Man, I don't know. I, there's just so much we have to pick up every piece of the life we used to love to keep ourselves at least enough to carry on. Everything's falling apart. We just have to salvage what we can salvage and push forward. Man, it's just wild. The world agrees that they'd rather see their faces filled with flies when I'd want to keep white roses in their eyes. This album hits you with image after image and emotion after emotion and like memento mori after memento mori. This is a song about death and kind of life after death and it just presents it to you in a way that you've never thought about it before. It's an album that makes you think in new ways. And really, if you're going to sum up the album in one track, if someone asks me, hey, what's in the airplane over the sea like? I'm going to show them Holland 1945 because this is pretty much what the whole album is like in my memory and just general summation up next after that wild and raucous unforgettable track that is holland 1945 we move into the shortest track on the album clocking in at under two minutes communist daughter it's another pretty overtly sexual song and you can figure that out in less than half a verse by like the third line yeah <laughs> pretty much no yeah <laughs> it's not a real mountain <laughs> no People have talked about that, though, is like maybe this song represents mankind's perversion of nature, like how we've gone everywhere and just ruined everything. No matter if it's like the tallest mountaintop, wherever it is, no place on the earth is uncorrupted. Cars careening from the clouds. Like, who knows? Who knows? This is a surreal song. Communist Daughter is one of the most surreal moments on the album for me. Yeah, this one wasn't my favorite. I'd be a little worried if it was, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, it's part of the ambiance of the album. It's like set dressing. It needs to be here and it can't exist anywhere else. I think the album would be lesser without it, but it would also be way lesser without the album. They kind of do each other a favor. And after the shortest track on the album, of course, follow that sucker up with the longest track on the album, coming in at 8 minutes and 18 seconds, one of the longest tracks that we've ever talked about. Oh, comely. And incredibly, Jeff Mangum recorded all the vocals and the guitar together in one single 8-minute take. Really? Yeah, really. Pretty wild. I That's why if you listen closely, you can hear his bandmates swear at the end because they're just so blown away by what they've just witnessed. <laughs> Him cranking out this juggernaut, almost masterclass of a song. But stories kind of vary also. Some people say that it's not about Jeff. Some people say it's horn player Scott Spillane being excited that he recorded his own overdub all in one take. Mm. Or people say maybe it's guitarist and producer Robert Schneider. So who knows? Jury's out. Stories are clashing. Either way, it's an impressive take. Lyrically, O'Comley ties back some older themes, right? The adulterous parents, the father who's stepping out. This is a pretty unbelievable song. I think whereas like Holland 1945 is maybe the epitome of the album and Communist Daughter is the most surreal, I think O'Comley to me is one of the most impressive songs on this album. Just in the ways that it manages to be such an engaging song, even though it's eight minutes long. It is a long song. <laughs> yeah, it is. I don't know. Does it get old? Does it feel long? I've never felt too burdened by it, I guess. To be listening to this whole album in one listen and trying to take notes, it was a bit rough. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. It's also a song with a lot of Anne Frankish lyrics. It's true. I know they buried her body with others, her sister and mother and 500 families. Will she remember me 50 years later? I wish I could save her in some sort of time machine. We know who our enemies are. Jeez. He really is all about, I don't know, it's like a lot of body stuff in these lyrics. About, you know, pushing fingers through the notches in your spine. That comes later. But then, like, we feel ourselves inside some stranger's stomach. And you talked about inside mom inside a garbage can. And, like, there's just a lot of flesh and blood and, like, fluids and, like, goop. Yeah. It's a very goopy kind of album. And I, I don't know. Just deconstructing life in such a gross way is really intriguing. And then we're back with what I think is the second most 
distorted song on the album, Ghost. Apparently, aside from, you know, the Diary of Anne Frank and stuff, a lot of Jeff Mangum's inspiration for the album came from lucid dreams and encounters with ghosts and ghostly figures that he says he had. Honestly, I'm shocked that that's only true about this song. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean, not. It probably heavily inspired the other songs as well, but this is the one where he calls it out directly. Ghost goes way deeper into that ghost i know you live within me you know the whole album does kind of feel like a lucid dream of sorts transposed into songs so yeah i get it basically what he does in ghost i mean to talk about goop and like horrific body things he just describes all these gruesome deaths that these people who are coming back to him as ghosts experienced you know uh someone falling from the sky off a 14-story apartment building or you know spirits splitting the sun and someone born in a bottle rocket i, I don't know just all this stuff is really vicious and i want i had to wonder does jeff mangum own ghost detecting equipment apparently he's detected some ghosts there were several song titles that made the mixtaper want to <laughs> bring up previous <laughs> facts yeah i mean losing your seat on an aeroplane to a hat right <laughs> But I don't think he could have got Ryan the Ghost by me on this one. And there's more overt references to, you guessed it, Anne Frank. Uh, she was born in a bottle rocket in 1929. Of course, Anne Frank's birth year. I know that she'll live forever. She won't ever die. And she goes, and now she knows she'll never be afraid. And Frank, at one point, said, I've reached the point where I hardly care whether I live or die. The world will keep on turning without me, and I can't do anything to change events anyway. I'll just let matters take their course and concentrate on studying and hope that everything will be all right in the end. And it felt like, to me, like Jeff Mangum channels a lot of that in this song. References that. Uh, I can see that. Yeah. And just to talk about how her spirit left her body and split the sun, she'll live forever, all goes on and on. It reminds me more of that endless endless and the white light of eternity that he talked about earlier like the whole album to me at this point starts to tie back into itself all these themes and all these images feel related and like they come up again and again and again it's kind of wild and then we move into probably one of the hardest songs for us to talk about untitled there's no title there's no lyrics it's just an instrumental it feels out of place does it? I don't know. I got weird techno vibes from it that didn't feel like they fit. Mm. Well, there's like organ sounds and stuff. Stuff that reminds me more of that circus aesthetic instead of the World War II aesthetic. I think it fits. I think it belongs. If only to bridge the gap between the rest of the album and Two-Headed Boy Part 2. Because I think what it succeeds in doing is putting Two-Headed Boy Part 2 on an island mm. away from the rest of the album. Giving us some distance. I see. I don't know. Some people have described Untitled as the album's climatic moment. And emotionally, maybe. I think maybe that's true. Like, we've built up so much to get to this point, and then we've got Two-Headed Boy Part 2 coming around the bend to just, like, give us the death blow, the finishing punch, but Untitled has to get us there. It also actually has had titles in the past. Sometimes you might find it called The Penny Arcade in California, kind of because it sounds like an arcade. Kind of, again, it's that circus aesthetic that Mangum loved and wove so thoroughly into the album, into the art. And then we get into our closing track, probably the most emotional song on the album. Out on its island. Out on its, yeah, it's lonely little end of the album island two-headed boy part two it really i think brings a lot of the pieces of this album full circle it starts with another plea to this father figure character that's apparently been horrible throughout this album repeatedly right he's been stuck with a fork and he's throwing garbage he's making fetuses with flesh licking ladies like it's like wild stuff and he starts with this plea like please hear this song that i sing in your heart there's a spark that screams like he's still reaching out still trying to connect and and there's so many other moments that are full circle moments in my dreams you're alive and you're crying as your mouth moves in mine soft and sweet rings of flowers around your eyes really reminds me of born with roses in her eyes i'll love you for the rest of your life when you're ready king of carrot flowers part two gets revisited when we break we'll wait for our miracle god is a place where some holy spectacle lies where you'll wait for the rest of your life two-headed boy obviously gets revisited in its sequel she's all you could need one of my, actually my real, one of my favorite lines on the album is this one. It just catches me off guard every time. She's all you could need. She will feed you tomatoes and radio wire and retire to sheets safe and clean. I think it's just one of the most memorable lines of the album. It reminds me of the radio made for two playing music for his lover from the first Two-Headed Boy. It reminds me of all the sheets imagery that we've had in like Holland 1945 and other places. It's just killer. What'd you think of Two-Headed Boy Part 2? I liked Part 1 better. Interesting. Why? Oh! 
It could be a uh, bias of I heard it first, but... Oh, wow. The sequel's never as good. Yeah, everybody knows that. I don't know. There was just something about the start of the first part that I liked better. Okay, that's fair. That beginning with the instrumentals into the two-headed boy just really put me in the mood for that song, whereas the beginning of part two didn't. Yeah, the beginning of part two is kind of creepy. Yeah. And, like, unsettling. And then it, I mean, lyrically and throughout, it doesn't do anything to settle you again or like focus your attention. It's a lot softer and a lot less driven than the first two headed boy. But I think that's because it's a reflection on everything we've hit on to this point. It doesn't need to propel the album forward like two headed boy does because it's recapping the album in a way that only it can. And this song and the album in turn end with the sound of Jeff Mangum setting down his guitar and walking away. Obviously, yeah, it fits perfectly with the end of the song he says don't hate her when she gets up to leave and then he gets up to leave but also zoom out take a larger perspective this is like symbolically this is him hanging up the guitar for good more or less this is him ending his recording career as an artist he has said all he needs to say played all he needed to play i mean poured absolutely everything left in his consciousness like into this album and he's done he's putting down the guitar and walking away and that is the end of in the airplane over the sea that's the end and that's the end of neutral milk hotel for a while for a bit that's true and i mean pretty much forever yeah <laughs> it's wild to think about i think it's such an intriguing album i mean just for the story behind it for the lyrics that are in it this is perfect cult classic material if there was ever an album destined to be a cult classic i feel like this is it it's like a haunted abandoned world war ii era carnival encapsulated in 11 songs so let's get into some final spin. The album might be done. We're not quite done yet. I admit, I'm I'm part of the Neutral Milk Hotel cult. I like this album a lot. It was a pivotal album in my music listening experience. And so maybe my scores are biased, but I don't think my scores are unique. I think a lot of people that like this album probably would agree with the scores. And a lot of people that don't like this album probably roll their eyes at the <laughs> scores. And that's fine. That's all well and good. I'm giving the music... A 94. I think not only do these songs like have a certain memorable quality to them, I think they also do a really good job at matching the lyrics. The melodies don't always make sense in terms of like traditional music theory, right? It doesn't always go where you expect it to go, but it always goes where the lyrics need it to go. And I think that's really cool. And to that point, lyrics straight up like 98. I don't know if an album can get much better lyrically. It's possible, and some have. My list is, it's got higher scores than a 98 for lyrics, I think. But this album, that's where it lands for me. A lot of metaphors, a lot of strange images. That's all I've got for the lyrics. I don't know even how to express how I feel about the lyrics. <laughs> instruments of production, 94? Weird instruments, lo-fi production, but I think it's intentional. I, like if you were trying to make an album that didn't sound like this, and it sounded like this, that would suck. But I think they use it as a tool to take this album to a place where they want and need it to go. The compression and the distortion and the singing saw, like the intentionality behind it and the fact that they're able to pull it off, I think so well, is what makes it so cool. 94 for instruments and production. And the vibe, I don't do it often, but I've got to give it a 100 for the vibe. I love this album cover to cover. I like the historical nature of it. I like the loose concept. I like the fever dream kind of feeling. There's not really, once you hit play on this album, there's nothing that really pulls you out of it so much as a hiccup. The closest you get, I guess, yeah, is Untitled with the Penny Arcade and the Carnival Organ kind of style. But otherwise, yeah, I'm just going to give it a 100 for the vibe. So its overall score is a 97.4, which is going to land it pretty high on the list. That lands it at number 8, below Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd and above Punisher by Phoebe Bridgers of the albums that we've done episodes on. Nice. Nice, I know. Now, let me also just say, throughout the year of healing, I've also had plenty of moments to heal and grow. And I think one thing I've noticed, I mean, you, you remember year one, you gave some scores that I was like put off by. Yep. Pink Floyd does come to mind. The Beach Boys come to mind. <laughs> Radiohead comes to mind. Kid Cudi comes to mind. He's a year of vengeance guy. Those weren't all in year one. No, but I'm just saying, I like there have been moments where I've been surprised in a bad way and critical of your scores. Mm. And my goal for the year of discovery, especially Especially if I'm going to be bringing you albums like this and albums that I want you to explore and expand the horizons, you can't be afraid to make a misstep. 
I don't think all these albums are going to be nines or tens or mind blowing for you in the same way that they are or might be for me or someone else. So I'm determined to be accepting of any score you give for all the albums. I feel like we've grown to that point. Fair enough. So feel free to roast it. But also, I do hope you like it. I hated it. No. no I'm <laughs> Hit me right in the hospital bills. <laughs> oh. What I'm going to say about this is i enjoyed it a lot while listening to it okay don't know if i'll be coming back that's fair i mean it's not just a casual listen for me either i have to be in the zone and because re-listenability and like my want to re-listen to it plays into my score more heavily than it does you then my score may be lower than what you might like or lower than what i might give it if i was just basing it off of how much i enjoyed that first listen okay once you take re-listenability into account the score drops a little for me i was quite interested and, and intrigued by the somewhat fever dream nonsense lyrics i enjoyed the beat and the instrumentals to pretty much all of the tracks and they have a good sound mm -hmm. so all in all it was it was a good album it was a very unique interesting album to learn about yeah unique is a word for it and so with all that in mind this one's gonna get seven potato lips out of ten <laughs> I like the unit potato lips because it almost sounds like potato <laughs> chips, but like not. Like when people do Pringles duck lips. I eat potato chips with my potato lips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seven is, is honestly where I kind of would have expected, but I also was like braced for six or lower, you know? Seven is, that's solid. Yeah, I could have gone six, but I decided seven. It depends on my mood, I think, where this would fall in my low sevens, high sixes. It has kind of quite a range. I think depending on my mood, I could put it as high as just below Nevermind or as low as just above Rascal Flats. That's a wide range. Yeah, I know. But for my mood currently and when I scored it, it is going right below Avril Lavigne. Okay, that puts it right above julian baker yeah cool that's where i'm putting my potato lips right yeah i think you know one of the things i said about kid a and radiohead was we came to the conclusion it was like listening to a painting and i think in the airplane over the sea is almost the same in a lot of ways like it's more of an art project an art piece than an album but it also is way more listenable as music i think yeah no absolutely so i think that helps it for you <laughs> <laughs> it's less beeps and boops. I think one of my critiques of your analogy of listening to a painting was that why would you ever want to listen to a visual media? There's something inherently wrong with that. And in this one, like you can you can listen to the painting. There's a audible piece to it that is intriguing and good <laughs> wow okay tell me how you really feel yeah my top three in album order king of carrot flowers part one yeah in the aeroplane over the sea nice that's the whole album wow <laughs> conorable mention to two-headed boy part one if you conorable mention two-headed boy part two i don't know where we'd go from there <laughs> yeah you don't get an extra top three pick just because you only took two and hall in 1945 solid definitely not unexpected but definitely solid top threes from you and i'll just go ahead now and say i'll take aeroplane over the sea for my playlist pick because i and i assume you're taking hall in 1945 but i'll let you confirm that it's hard not to i think it's the essence of this album I think it's lyrically one of the most intriguing. Musically, sonically, it's one of the most disorienting. I really like it a lot. Yeah, I think I'll have to take it. All right. Although, it would be really funny to stick you with the 8 minute and 18 second O'Comley. Nah, I can handle it on its own. Well, fair enough. No, but I am going to take Holland 1945. I'd just rather keep white roses in her eyes. That's all. What do you think? Solid start to the year discovery? Is this... This feels like a discovery kind of album, you know, one that you'd never heard of. And Oh, yeah, we're, we're getting out there. We're discovering new places. Mm -hmm. We're discovering new records to dock our podcast ship at. <laughs> yeah, good. That was my goal. I wanted to start off with something a little bit out there and a little bit wild just to see, you know, just to get your thoughts on it. If you want to come along in the spin it a year ship on this uh, journey of discovery, 
Where can they do that? Oh, good question. Right here in your podcast feed, where all the episodes will be. But also, you can find us on social media, at SpinitPod on X, and at SpinitPod Official on Instagram, and on the web at www.spinitpod.com. That's where all the fun stuff is, and will continue to be. One W for every year. Oh my goodness, you're right. We're in year four now. We can't add a W next year, but... www.wspinitpod.com. No way. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so excited for year four. Oh, it's so good. We're finally here. We've made it to a fourth year. Unreal. Think about how many times we've doubled. We just doubled our two-year anniversary, actually. Which was a double of our one-year anniversary. What's a quadruple of that? We're a double of our two-year, which is a double of the one year. You're right. In in a unit of year, we've doubled twice. You're right. What a confusing thing. Oh, boy. Welcome to the start of our second double. We'll we'll see you for more Discovery next week. (laughs) Tell a friend who... Has nice lips. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Tell a friend with lips as well-drawn as that kid. (laughs) And uh, we'll see you next week. Until then, keep keep spinning. spinning. You know, I bet a lot of people have done podcast episodes on this album. And I would venture, I'd hazard a guess, that we're the podcast that has talked the most about (laughs) the lips on the album cover. (laughs) And it's all thanks to you. Hey, adventure is out there. Uh Uh-huh. Gotta look for adventure in the most unlikely of places. Oh, uh, there seems to be a knock at the door. I think it's the, I think it's the debt collectors. Something about my hospital bills. (laughs) Oh, it's like the debt collectors. (laughs) Like, what? Look, I mean, if I had known you'd have hospital bills after the year of healing, maybe we would have taken it easier. Maybe it would have been a month of healing. We could have done it faster. This is what I get for going to an out-of-network hospital. Hey, we're in all the podcast networks. (laughs) 